everybody um, uh, in the audience uh, for, for, for turning up in such great numbers. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, today, I wanted to talk to you about why causal AI is the only path to true AI. We will outline some of the problems with the current uh, methodologies, and we will propose a way forward uh, in the field. We will also show practically examples um, of where this new category of intelligent machines adds a lot of value. So let's get started. First, let's celebrate um, some, some of the great successes that, that machine learning um, has had over the years. We all know that, um, and, and my PhD is in computer vision, if we have a, a large collection of images and we have sufficient processing power, we can do a great job at, at examples like this. Is this a cat or a dog, right? We can do amazing stuff and the current methods work fantastically in those cases. We all got really excited uh, about um, the world champion losing to a machine at the game of Go, which has so many more permutations than a game of chess. Um, and I, you know, I, I remember myself reading in uh, reading about it. Uh, it was you know super exciting. The entire community got uh, really excited. Now, there is a there is one common thing between the cats and the game of Go. They're both examples of static systems. In other words, the game of Go always looks like a game of Go. There's certain number of moves, certain number of um, you know, the, the board is fixed. There's a certain number of legal moves and, and so on and so forth. Cats, well, always they always look like cats. Sure, we have different breeds, but unless an alien cat falls from outer space, a uh, cat will always be a cat, right? Now imagine if you, uh, if you trained a really nice neural network, whatever your favorite algo is, to recognize cats and versus dogs, and I show you, uh, show this algorithm a picture of a cat dog. What do you think the algorithm would do? Well, the algorithm will either say, oh, there is a cat and a dog here, great. Um, or it will be a bit confused. Um, it will do one of these two things, right? Uh, but none of those things, uh, uh, you know, th th basically what that tells you is that the algorithm didn't really learn anything about being able to differentiate between cats and dogs. Um, and unfortunately, the real world is very much like uh, a lot of cat dog scenarios. So if you look at the world economy, uh, what happened yesterday may have nothing to do with what will happen tomorrow. And the pandemic was an example of how a regime shift can happen in the economy. Um, so what's interesting about the cat dog is that when you're a human and I show you a cat dog, something that doesn't exist, you don't need to see millions of, of samples of it to learn that it's this imaginary thing. You can learn from just looking at it once. Um, and that's kind of you know, powerful for, 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 for of the, of kind of the human intelligence, but machines currently cannot do that. They, they need millions, billions, hundreds of thousands, thousands, depends on the algorithm, examples of cat dog things. Um, to learn that this thing exists or it's it's a fiction. So they don't really have an understanding of the real world. And if you're training an algorithm to work in the real economy, uh, well, then you're faced with cat dogs all the time, just kind of randomly occurring and your algorithms will keep tripping over and not producing value. And the reason for that more scientifically or more uh, concretely is because the current methods essentially fit curves to data, really. That's what they do. No matter how fancy their names are, no matter how, um, how much math we hide behind the scenes, ultimately, this is what they're doing. If it's a multidimensional problem, well, then we're not fitting a curve, but we're fitting a hyperplane, but it's still essentially the same process. And that has limitations. And you can see here how I was able to fit three curves uh, on the same data set. Um, on the left, I have underfitted curve. On the right, I have overfitted curve. Both cases uh, do, do not uh, generalize well in the real world. Uh, and this is 
what real business problems are all about. They're all about finding things that generalize uh, when we haven't had maybe any past data to, to train on. So we have a problem. And here's a, one of the, uh, the, the symptoms of the problem. It's not the cause, it's the symptom. Um, a human brain requires about 20 watts of energy to function. That's the equivalent of a light bulb. A deep neural network consumes more, you know, emits more CO2 in the training process than a diesel vehicle in its lifetime, right? And yet the, the human brain is still more generalizable than, um, uh, than the artificial neural network that uh, polluted our environment. So machine learning is fundamentally broken, we believe. Um, and this is just one of the symptoms. But the cause of it, so to speak, is that it's relatively simplistic in the way it works, right? All it does, it picks up correlations in historical data. And as you have all know, you know, the famous uh, expression in statistics is that correlation does not imply causation. And the video that I'm showing you is, um, it's just a funny video uh, of, of exactly that. Um, if I gave this to a computer vision system that use current, current methodologies, that system will learn that cats cause motorbike accidents. Um, and they will incorrectly learn that because they have no real understanding of the real world. They'll just look at past correlations in the data and use those to predict the future or make inferences, right? So machine learning as it is currently is fundamentally broken because it has no understanding of cause and effect. It simply fits spurious correlations. Um, it learns spurious correlations from, from, from the data and it hopes that, that the future will be similar to the past. And that is fine for cat versus dog but it's not so fine uh, for the real uh, world where, uh, where the world is changing really, really rapidly, especially during pandemics. Um, and here are examples where machine learning is broken. So this guy here lost $20 million a day using automated AI platform. Um, and the reason he lost 20 million a day is because uh, and I'm guessing here, the world changed and that system was trained on, uh, on spurious correlations from the past that were no longer uh, applicable in the future. Uh, we have you know, IBM Watson, which once was considered, you know, holy grail, can do anything. Um, here we have a failure to understand. Um, in other words, um, it did not really, could not tell the difference between correlation and causation and therefore um, it, it provided some unsafe uh, cancer recommendations. Um, we have another example which has now been discarded uh, from, from Amazon, uh, which, uh, which this system had picked up spurious correlations um, from, the, from the training data and was um, rejecting uh, more women, female resumes than, than men's. And that's not because um, the company or the designer of the algorithm was evil in its nature, but it's because the, it's very hard um, when you have a large correlation matrix uh, to tell the difference between spurious and not spurious. Um, and some more here as well. Um, if you thought computer vision is solved, well, actually it's, it's not really solved. Uh, if you have something a little bit more complicated, you know, is, what is this, a pretzel or a mushroom, right? Um, it's very easy to tell it's a mushroom, but the algorithm thought it was a pretzel with 99% confidence. Is this a dragonfly or is it a manhole cover? Well, the algorithm thought it was a manhole cover with 99% accuracy. Here are some funny uh, and sad at the same time examples of a Microsoft chatbot who was, you know, who was going wild and doing, you know, making a very inappropriate uh, endorsement slash comments um, on Twitter. Uh, because, you know, if you understand the maths behind it, it's not surprised that it would do this, uh, but um, it's very disappointing um, for people that think machine learning is all solved. Um, 
uh, you know, when in reality, these algorithms have really no understanding of the real world. They're just picking up some spurious stuff from the past and hoping that it translates to the future. So hopefully by now I've convinced you that um, we have a problem. And whenever we have a problem in science, well, we go back to the drawing board and come up with some new science. Um, and this has happened many times in history, right? Um, we had um, one type of physics replacing another type of physics, probably, you know, a new type of physics will, will replace our current understanding of physics. And well, same in, in artificial intelligence. We thought we have nailed artificial intelligence, um, but then, you know, uh, then we realized that correlations are very limited uh, and we need to go further. So luckily, uh, the community has already started working on this new type of artificial intelligence uh, that we call causal AI. A new type of science that is able to understand the difference between spurious correlation and cause and effect relationships. And if you would like to, to have one concrete reason why you should care about this, well, it's because it produces models that actually work in the real world. Here are models on the right, uh, are models built uh, with causal AI, and models on the left are models built using current state-of-the-art machine learning, neural networks, deep neural networks, uh, you name it, they're there. And the difference in performance is not in backtest or training, right? This is in the real world. These are models that have been trained, deployed in production and been able to monitor them uh, in the real world. And you can see uh, causal AI models generalize so much better. Um, so in, in other words, by 42% in, in the instances that we've observed in the real world. Now, before you get, so that's the, the motivation why you should care, but there are other things why causal AI is superior uh, related to explainability as well, which we will touch upon in a minute uh, and other, other reasons. But before you get too excited, I think it's my duty to let you know that this is still a nascent science. It is right at the beginning of its development and we haven't solved everything just yet. But the potential is there and we have more and more scientists joining us every day and that's great. But let me outline some of the current problems uh, with, with the new science and um, as a company we are leading the way into solving these problems. So current methods have, you know, as is, as is with any nascent science, certain limitations when applied in the real world. Um, and these are some of the assumptions that uh, you would be violating if you picked up a method from the academic literature and, and tried to apply it to the real world. Uh, but rest assured, we're working very hard and we already have models, or sorry, methods that, uh, that do not rely on these uh, simplistic assumptions and would be very happy to, to share how we went and solved them. So causal AI, New science, we need it because current science does not work in many real world examples. Uh, it produces better results, as I showed you in the previous slide, um, but it can do much more than simply do better predictions. The first thing that it can do better than current state of the art, it can bring in the human knowledge in a, in a very different way. So current machine learning methods rely on feature selection uh, you know, as a way to bringing the human input into the algorithm. Well, that's fine, but it's a bit limiting. If you ask a human, hey, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the, how the system works? They're not gonna be like, oh yes, this feature is 0 0.3 and this other one 0 0.5. They'll tell you a lot more convoluted explanation of how a system works. So if they're talking about the economy, they'll talk about it Oh, if we're in this regime, then this and this happens, and this will happen. Uh, they'll tell you, you know, their knowledge is expressed in a in a lot richer format than simply choosing what goes into an algorithm. So we think that current machine learning systems that rely on feature selection as a human input are very limiting, 
Uh, and causal AI methods have a lot more uh, rich and intuitive way to bring in the human knowledge into, into the algorithm, which is great. Um, then we can do the second thing that causal AI can do uh, that current ML cannot do uh, is to evaluate the, the effect of interventions. And what does that mean? Well, that means, can we learn something about a system without actually having to observe that in training data, right? So this is going beyond observational data. Could we perform an intervention in a simulation type of environment and really understand uh, what the system would, uh, you know, would do in such an instance? So could we raise interest rates uh, by 1% what would the effect of that be on jobs, right? Sure, you can get the Bank of England to raise the rates and then see, wait for a year or two, but wouldn't it be better if you could just do this without raising the rates and understanding if you should raise the rates? Uh, and this is something that classic simulation techniques cannot do because they're also based on spurious correlations. Generating artificial data also does not work because it's based on a, on a model. The only way to, to really answer this question of what if is through causal model and it's very powerful. Now, uh, the third thing that causal AI can do that uh, traditional AI cannot do is it cannot imagine. So how do us as humans, when we learn something, we can either learn by observing observational data in the real world, uh, or we can imagine something and without it ha actually having to happen, we can still learn about it. And this is a, a missing piece in the current um, machine learning literature is machines just cannot imagine um, what would have been, what would what an alternative world would look like and learn from that without having to observe the data. So this is super powerful. So as I said, in addition to better models, we have three things that uh, actually four things um, I should I should say three things on this slide um, four things in total that uh, that causal AI can do that um, traditional ML cannot so one is to, to empower humans to bring in knowledge beyond feature selection uh, two will be is to evaluate the effect of of an intervention without having to do the intervention or relying on uh, on simulations three is to teach machine to let machines imagine and learn from something that hasn't uh, happened yet I going beyond observational data. And number four, uh, explainability, which I'm sure we will touch upon uh, later as well. Um, so we motivated the reason for the new science. Uh, now let's, let's go and solve some real world problems with it, right? Imagine you, you, you have to solve a very difficult problem and you don't know um, what drives uh, the, uh, the variable that you're interested in, in studying, right? You may want to, um, to predict some macroeconomic variable. You may want to predict a certain enzyme in, in a blood sample, whatever the case is, a system that is so complex that you do, really don't know what is driving it, right? And you want to be able to go and search a very large pool of data and you want the machine to tell you hey i know you didn't know what drives this system you didn't know the causal drivers but here is my help here are i went and did some searching and i found things that matter for this system and if you try to do this with current technology you will encounter a big problem you will encounter a lot of false positives. You will get things like, uh, you know, spurious correlations popping out left, right, and center. The bigger your data lake is, the bigger this problem is. And here is a very concrete example of us doing this um, for the purpose of predicting um, LNG, natural gas. We had the movement of every single ship around the globe and what it was carrying. And we wanted to see, can we search this data automatically and figuring out which ports and uh, mattered in the, in the price for, for natural gas. 
And when we did it with traditional machine learning, we found out a lot of spurious stuff uh, and we were still not sure. And we, we went and did all of the feature selection techniques, clustering, whatever we needed to do to eliminate spurious correlations. But we still ended up uh, with uh, with bunch of them that was spurious. For example, the Trinidad LNG exports was a, a you know a, a correlated feature, very highly correlated feature. So we thought, okay, must be important. Um, but then when we repeated this experiment with causal AI. Trinidad LNG experts were found to be spurious and although high cor highly correlated, irrelevant. Uh, and when we compare and contrasted the performance of both models, we found out that causal AI models, because they were able to eliminate spurious correlations, they were 30%, 34% better in terms of performance. Here's another example where we did this at scale. We want to understand what drives inflation and we had the whole economy. Uh, and when we did standard correlation-based feature selection, we found 26 drivers, but the reality was only four of them were true drivers. Uh, and causal AI came there to the rescue and was able to tell us, you know, do not use this 22 spurious things because that will lead to, to bad models. Instead, use this just, just these four and you will get really good performance. Here is another example of why you should care about causal AI. Causal AI is actually able to perform better uh, when you have a handful of data points. This is an example of only four data points a year. Uh, and we can see how well it's doing compared to, to, to you know, current state of the art. And uh, if you like some numbers, it is essentially more than, you know, two times better in terms of error rates. Uh, we are really passionate about uh, the sustainable development goals at Causalens, and we love to help companies achieve them. Uh, and here is an example of using causal AI to reduce emissions. So in this example, uh, with, with the same approach of, we have a very complex system we want to optimize it. We do not know what data is driving the system. Um, we want to find out what external data is driving the demand for our cargo planes. That was the biggest problem in for this particular client. Uh, and in the same fashion as before, we were able to search a very large pool of data and eliminate all the spurious stuff, but find only the bits that really drive the system. And we were able to say, save millions of tons of CO2 by improving the forecasting by using external data and therefore having a better load factor on the plane. So rather than playing, uh, you know, flying planes half empty, we were able to, to get them uh, you know, fuller. And that led to a huge saving for the customer. But what we were most excited about uh, was the millions of tons of CO2 we saved by being able to automatically find out the causal drivers and incorporate them in the client model. Um, we've been able to, do, to, to help towards other um, uh, goals as well. Um, in this case, it's in the uh, case of clean energy. The biggest problem with clean energy is that you tend to generate it when you don't need it. Think about solar. Um, People uh, consume more energy in the evenings, you know, showers, dinners, things like that, but the sun doesn't shine at night. So you end up having a lot of energy generated at a time you don't need it. So you need to think about storage facilities and you also need to think about when do you unload, offload those storage facilities. In order to be able to do that, you need to be able to predict demand um, of the grid, but also the uh, you need to be able to project how much your solar or wind farm is going to produce, right? Very complex problem. And also relies on being able to understand causal drivers uh, of the population as well. Uh, and, you know, here is a very concrete example of how causal models outperform traditional state of the art by 8%. And this has, you know, massive ramifications for optimization of our grid uh, and adopting renewables. We went to healthcare. We want to understand how causal AI can do there. We want. We took one uh, very important problem in in the pandemic, which is 
patient flow. You know, how many people are going to turn up to hospital today and what services will they need? And we found out that going away from machine learning to causal AI allowed us to, um, uh, to, to improve patient flow and therefore save 4% of all, all healthcare costs, right? That is 8 billion per year of potential savings we can generate if we were to roll this out beyond the proof of concept. So just to go back, um, I showed you examples of what we have done so far, but we do want to use causality to solve all of these other problems that we outlined at the beginning of our, our presentation. Um, and I would like to invite you guys to join this new revolution, this new science, this new way, this new uh, category of intelligent machines, and let's together unlock and, and, and help the world. Um, you know, let's forget about spurious correlations and let's start teaching machines to understand cause and effect. In other words, let's make machine under machines understand the real world. Thank you so much for being here. Here's a little present from me to you. If you wanted to get into this new science, here's a bit of a reading list. Um, thank you so much for listening. And now um, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Doc, for your presentation. Very interesting. We've got lots of questions, so we'll try to go through as many as we can uh, with the time that we have left. Any that we, we don't get to um, directly there. Thanks for making it to the conversation there. All right, if we start from the first one from Manny, he asks, what, what can we do in terms of process or techniques to reduce the causality correlation conundrum, even if we are not using or have access to causal AI models. Yeah, so um, as I said, um, this is um, this is a this is a nascent science. Uh, it is in, in development. Um, I think it will be very hard, and, and the way it works is completely different from from you know the workflows for causal AI completely different from the workflows uh, for machine learning. So in machine learning, okay, you clean the data, you extract some features, you select some features, you decide which algo parameters, blah, blah, okay, fine. Uh, causal AI works in a completely different way. We have the processes, you know, completely different. We, we go, we start with causal discovery, we get a causal diagram, we pass the code, we are able to adjust if we want the causal diagram with a human input, um, we don't have to. We then pass that on um, to, to causal uh, modeling frameworks, which are you know, very different from, um, from regression methods. We pass that on and then we, we're able to fit a causal model, right? So it will be very hard to just like somehow hack in some causality into, into a current workflow. You need to really rethink the entire process, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so, Alessandro, I'm, I'm having difficulty hearing you. I'm not sure if it's... Uh, Any better? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Any better now? Uh, yeah, a little bit better, yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's try with that. Um, so, Amani is asking again, are there still tools or frameworks out there that are less broken, like you mentioned, that ML is broken? What are they? Sorry, could, could you repeat that? I didn't catch it. So are there still tools and frameworks out there that are less broken, like you mentioned, than ML is broken? And what are they? Right, yeah. So, so the, 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 you know, we ha we've had a lot of scientists getting into causal AI recently um, and, and for, you know, for good reasons, uh, because, you know, we, we've all been able to observe the shortfalls of current machine learning. So there's a lot of excitement uh, around it. And there's a lot of, it's an active area of research. So we have two problems. We have the first problem is that uh, the current methods have uh, assumptions that do not translate in the real world. And two, we have an explosion of approaches and we do not know which ones we should use given um, 
uh, given a given a scenario, given a business problem. So uh, we need to do two things. The first thing we need to do is invent new methods which do not have those limiting assumptions. And that's something we do at Causal Lens. We invent, invent new methods uh, for causal AI that do not have limitations and assumptions. And the second thing is we need to, uh, to solve the second problem. There's a need to automatically select the right method given the, the problem, right? And so that's where automated causal AI comes in. Uh, that's another thing we're working on, but I don't think, unfortunately, there are any quick fixes beyond inventing uh, and having access or having access to to methods that do not have limiting assumptions. Um, and you'll need method. You need a machine that can pick the right methods for you as well. Cool. Thank you for that. And uh, then the question from Bon. Uh, I, I, I think you, you've covered some of this presentation, but just in case you wanted to add something more to it. So I was asking, uh, can you tell us a recent use case in practice, uh, which your team have created? Yeah, so I think in the presentation, we showed a bunch of use cases and they were all real that our team has worked on uh, and they were all results from production. So this is not just something we prepared for this presentation. This is what we worked on for real and those were results from production models. Cool. Uh, Luis asks, um, do you have any reference for the value? Our performance the art ML models. We'd love to find out in more details um, on this. So, Alessandro, it was very broken. I, I assume. You, you uh, uh -huh. Yes, yeah, so asking uh, if you have any references for the state of the art ML models. Right, hey so. Alessandro, uh, I think your audio feed might be broken. Um, so do you, you want to just uh, come out and come in again? Yeah, okay. Cool, perfect. Darko, can you hear me okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Cool. I, I think I think it might be him on there. So I'll just while he's um hopping back in again, I'll just ask um Louise uh, had a question. So she's asked, do you have any references for the 42% value you quoted for causal AI models outperforming state of the art machine learning models? Um yes, actually. Well, those those are production models that we maintain for our clients. So it's very hard. It's not a scientific paper, uh, which I think is the value of, of that result. The, you know, the significance of the result is that it's not um, you know, a paper that we wrote and it doesn't work. This this were real world models from you know in production for clients. Um, but uh on the benchmarking, we will have we have a new rips paper coming out. Um, and I would, would love, be delighted to share that. Yeah. Cool, perfect. Um, then we've got the next question from um, Eyal, I think I'm, hope I'm saying that right. Um, I know that obviously you, you actually published um, some book links and some other resource links. Would you be able to share that screen again? Because we've got quite a lot of people asking to see that link list again. Um, and they're yeah. particularly, yeah. Yeah, Perfect. of course, of course. I think that's a very, you know, that's my, my little present to, to you guys. I think it's- Yeah, yeah, perfect. To, uh, so, yeah. yeah, so quite a few of you guys in the chat were asking for that list. So I'll just leave that up for a little bit while, while we yeah. do some questions so you can write them down. Um, um, and they, uh, we've got a question from David Newman. Um, how is Cosmo AI different from symbolic AI? Um, I do not know what, um, what what is the definition of symbolic AI? I've never okay. heard of it before. No worries. Um, so if if he, if, the, if he could define it, I would love to comment on it. Perfect, perfect. And then I've got a really good question from um, Amit. Um, is Kaja AI being applied towards the COVID response at all? Or do you have any interaction or are you working towards anything with that? Oh, yes, actually. Very early on in the pandemic, we helped a lot of our clients navigate the crisis by very granular predictions at a city and a regional level. Um, and so, so yes, um, I think we, we will also feature in some um, a newspaper article about this success. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we, we do what we can and we do that without uh, taking payment for our clients. Yeah, no, that's great. That's fantastic. Cool. So I'm just going to Poodle down, see there's a few more. 
So got a really good question, another one from Bon. Um, so healthcare have been using causal uh, inference for a while to test the effect of some medicines or yeah. particular treatments. Yeah. Um, how is the approach of causal AI, which you mentioned different or similar to previous methods used? So the major difference is that our approach works in a dynamic system. So uh, I would say the, uh, the use in medicine uh, and in, in diagnostics is great and we, we love it and it's great that people are working on it. Uh, but the causal factors there do not change, right? If you have, a, if there is a condition, medical condition, uh, the causal factors that generate it tend to be stable over time. They're the same always, right? By definition, but in the real world, causal drivers can, can change and uh, having ability to rediscover them is something that has been missing so far. So causal discovery for dynamic system is, is uh, it's the area in which we are uh, experts at and where we've brought the most value. Oh yeah, that makes total sense. Um, we've got a good question from Jose. Uh, what sort of tools do you use for building, debugging and deploying causal AI models? Uh, all the all the technology is is proprietary in house. Um, we have the world. We we released the world's first causal AI platform uh, a few months ago, and um, that's our signature product. Uh, and that's what we use for for building the building causal models, for running them in production, and so on. Debugging them, yeah. Uh, explainability. It's all in the platform. Yeah, perfect. Um, I guess follow on from that from um, Rafal. Uh, is there any more in the causal approach than removing correlations? Uh, so yeah, absolutely. So uh, we, it's not about removing correlations. It's about how machines learn, right? So current machine learning learns by correlations and therefore is so limiting. So it's about how can we change how machines learn is what we're trying to do here. So it's Sure, you can use causal AI to say what is a spurious correlation, but that's not the point. Um, the point is, can we teach machines a little bit, you know, to, to look, to, to learn a bit more like humans and really understand the environment in which they're operating, as opposed to blindly looking at patterns in data. So I guess a, a question from us then is, you know, when does uh, causality add the most value so when you have a little data or when you have a lot of data yeah that, that's a great question um i think i showed one example where um we're having little data you don't really have a choice you have to use causal ai um but actually maybe a better um better way to to answer that question is to say you know why uh why do we want to limit ourselves to small or big data why don't we always uh try to find value at scale um, and in that case having causal ai allows you to effectively um, eliminate spurious things that appear in the data although you're using larger data set but i would say you know in, in case of small data you have no choice in, in case of big data it will generalize better yeah and then we've got like uh three repeated questions in a row basically about asking if there's um, open source available? Is there anything that, that people have that they can experiment with? I don't know if there is or not. Yeah, so there are, of, as I said, the academic literature uh, is booming with causal AI uh, right now. Um, people are waking up to the shortfalls of, of machine learning and there are open source methodologies. Uh, we recently implemented 78 different algorithms for causal discovery. Uh, but we were able to show the limitations uh, of those. So if you like, they are open source things, but they have severe limitations when applied uh, to the real world because they have assumptions that do not hold in the real world. So yes, you can use open source stuff, but you may get disappointed. And I think one of the key takeaways from this talk is that we need to work towards um, approaches do not, that do not have such limiting assumptions. Uh, and that's what we are doing as well at Causalens. Cool, perfect. Got quite um, just a long question from Zana, so bear with me while I read it out. Uh, it says, you mentioned that Causa AI also works for time series forecasting. Yeah. Does it suffer from a known issue in prediction of sparse cohort, for example, when the training data has a large proportion of missing data? Right, well, we are, we are I guess, um, famous for time series. 
Um, and most of our problems in times that we solve a time series. Uh, as I said, we are the way we differentiate um, versus what was available so far is, is kind of dynamic versus static systems and time series are, you know, the ultimate uh, way to represent dynamic systems. Um, so um, it's, it's a bit of a generic question. I would say that uh, for any approach to work in the real world when there are time series involved, it should not assume clean data. It should assume dirty data. And that's how we've designed all of our systems to assume dirty data and have an automated way of cleaning it. So I would say, yes, we are, you know, we've been doing time series uh, for a long time. Um, all of the top hedge funds use our time series prediction technology. And the reason they use it is because it works in the real world and does not assume clean data. Yeah, cool, that's great. Um, and then I guess, uh, you know, what is most important, the modeling technique or the data that you ingest into your model framework? Or like, what's the importance between the split basically? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's a bit of a philosophical one, but practically um, if, you if you have settled on, on a simpler model because you want to, you know, use the old star, old, old machine learning, and you want explainability, then data is all it matters because, you know, you're just combining it in a linear way. Um, if you have, um, if, if you use, uh, you know, uh, good data and you use more complex methodologies, you have a high risk of overfitting. So it kind of negates the value um, of the data as well. So I would say it's a combination, um, combination of, of both. Uh, I think both are equally uh, important, uh, but I think, uh, I, I do think that um, that having access to, you know, having technology that can search for valuable data and then, you know, combine it in the right way is what matters as opposed to is it data or techniques. I think both matter um, equally, um, so to speak. Cool, thank you very much. And we've got um, two questions from Manuel, so I'll try and fit them together. But um, on slide 13, I guess your slides are up um, already, but uh, saying causal AI versus state-of-the-art model performance, yeah. can you let us know which model that was like you were referencing to or which model has it been proven against? Uh, right, so which, so which slide is this? So slide 13. Right, okay, so... So actually here, uh, we are not talking about a single model. Uh, you can see it's a distribution. So it's many models, uh, many models that are built with causal AI and many models that are built with state-of-the-art machine learning. And this is the score, right? So this is the average score here of all of the causal AI models. This is the average score of all um, uh, state-of-the-art ML models. Uh, and what we, say, what we were saying is that on average, um, was the model perform better by 42%. So it's a large number of models in production as opposed to one model. Cool, perfect. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, and then I've got again quite a long question from um, Vedran. Hang on, oh, lost it, there you go. Um, would you say, oh, hang on, lost it again, sorry. Would you say that counterfactual reasoning yeah. enables for emulating experimental settings using observational data? And then the second part of that question is, what is the role of counterfactual reasoning in causal inference? Uh, right. So, so that that is a bit of a um, bit, bit of a lo longer discussion. But um, mm -hmm. I think I think you can, um, you know, th there is there is a way to extract <clears throat> things from observational data, <clears throat> and that's where causal discovery comes in. But there is a limitation to observational data as well, and having uh, you know a, a causal model uh, does imply um, ability to do counterfactual. So it goes back, I guess, to the definition of what is a causal model. Um, and if you are unable to you know to do counterfactuals, then your model is not causal. So you know I have answered the question in a slightly different way, but I think. Um, it all starts from the definition of what is a causal model. So, and then there's, you know, there's a ladder of causality as well. Um, you know, how proper the causal model is depends on how high you've, you've climbed the ladder uh, and counterfactuals are at the top there. Probably a, a second talk in itself. <laughs> 
<laughs> going into that. Uh, we've got another uh, question from Aeon uh, Null, I think I'm saying it right. Um, as you said, Kaja AI is fairly newish and it's quite difficult. Is there a course or sometime something that you recommend to learn the topic or for attendees if they want to do more of a deep dive into learning? Uh, they should apply for a job at Kozolans, I would say. Uh, cool. But... All right. There you go. Good pitch. Good pitch. <laughs> Cool. So yeah, if you want to know more, obviously you've got, you know, um, I'll get Amy to pop in the information in the chat again about, um, you know, getting in touch with Darka or getting in touch with the company. So if you guys want to reach out, you know, please, please feel free to do that. Um, got from Manny, when doing feature engineering or selection yeah. extraction, how do we separate the real features from the misleading ones? Uh, well, that's what causal AI is all about, right? Misleading are spurious correlations. Causal features are ones that are not spurious uh, and um, and it will hold uh, indefinitely. So, I mean, that's that's the whole point of it. And as I said, causal discovery is very different from uh, feature selection. So, feature selection relies on clustering, relies on mutual information. Um, correlation methods, which can vary from, you know, Pearson to whatever, and that's how you do it. But when you do um, causal uh, approaches, you do not do that. You you have causal discovery methods, which are completely different algorithms. Um, so it's, yeah, it's like comparing um, apples and oranges, I guess. Yeah. Um, and we've got another qu uh, question from Michael. Um, do you think there are any software libraries or packages which get us any closer to creating useful causal models? Uh, as I said, there are many packages, uh, but uh, all of them have severe limitations for the real world because they rely on unrealistic assumptions. And we had a slide on, on the assumptions earlier. Uh, so I think they're a good starting point to learn about it, but um, you would need to um, you would need either to license our platform or invent uh, an algorithm because you may get disappointed with what's currently out there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. We've got a question from Alice. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a great talk. Um, which causal discovery method do you use? Uh, constraint, score, or functional model based? First question. Um, and are you then using these to identify confounders to be included in your model? Yeah, so we do not think that there is one causal discovery method that works in all cases. So we build intelligence on top to automatically choose the right uh, causal discovery based on the on the, the problem at hand. So we look at this from a meta perspective and we think about the, our, our technology like as a virtual data scientist that is able to try out different methods and figure out uh, what works the best. Um, and the other question, well, depends, you know, if you have causal sufficiency or not in your data set. Um, it, if you do, you know, then founding confounders would be, you know, it would work. If you don't have, then, you know, you may miss out something. So it's a bit of a longer discussion. Uh, and yeah, but it's a very interesting one. We'll be happy to, to take it offline. Cool, perfect. And a bit of a, um, I don't know, existential question, I guess, from Rafael. But what uh, what's the way to, to learn machines to feel beyond reading patterns? Or what's the way to teach machines to feel beyond reading patterns? Uh, yeah, so so causal AI is this is a step. It's a necessary step towards uh, artificial general intelligence. It's not a sufficient step, right? So just to be clear, um, we think that it's a uh, it's the step forward from where we are now, from the status quo. And we, you know, if, if you remember the title of the talk is why causal AI is the path to true AI. It's not true AI itself. So just want to be clear that here we are talking about a major improvement to current approaches, but we're not suggesting that this is AGI and we still have a few more steps to get there. Cool, perfect, yeah, thank you very much. And then I've got a question from Abhijit. Uh, how is your modeling different from modeling a set of differential equations that each explain part of the phenomenon being studied? Wow, differential equations, we haven't had that question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I didn't realize people still do differential equations, but. Uh, <laughs> I would say differential equations, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, we haven't benchmarked against, but I think um, differential equations, you know, if I remember uh, uh, well, when I tried them last time in the context of finance, had also severe uh, assumptions, you know, severe limit limiting assumptions behind them. So 
Um, I think here we're talking about something that is a lot more generalizable than coming up with equations. Um, equations are nice and everything, but um, they tend to be oversimplified, you know, oversimplify things. So this is this is going. Can we retain the explainability of what of an equation while being able to be, more, you know, answer questions in a lot more general uh, way? Um, because the real world is a lot more complex than set of equations is what we yeah. need. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we've got a question from uh, Sunil. How what does it with data quality issues in data warehouses or data lakes? Yeah, so we don't believe in this approach of first clean the data, build the data, like then do analytics. We think that this should be one of the same thing. We have to have technology that assumes dirty data. And I cannot stress this enough because what's the point of building a model with clean data, put it in production, and then guess what will happen? The real world will generate dirty data again your model will fail. So what was the point of cleaning data, building this beautiful model when it's not going to work? Uh, we believe that technology should be able to ingest dirty data and still do something about it um, and be able to work. So we do not like this approach of data lake cleaning data, then do modeling. Let's do modeling uh, straight away with dirty data. That's, that's the value add. And then you don't need to worry about production as well. Cool. Perfect. And we've got, um, I guess, quite of again, uh, kind of an open question from Ali. Uh, will causal AI replace the traditional machine learning methods in the future, or do you think they will go hand in hand? Uh, as I said in, at the beginning of my talk, I think there are use cases where current machine learning methods are just fine, and we should use them there uh, and continue to use them there. Um, it just happens that many, many uh, real world business cases cannot be solved with them. And that's where we see causal AI being applied first. Um, so I would see them, you know, probably hand in hand for the next few years. Cool, perfect. And then I guess going back to what you're saying about um, obviously using that kind of dirty data uh, right at the start, do you generate features on that dirty data or do you just leave it as is? Uh, yeah, so the, there's a couple of steps there. Uh, one is how can we optimally clean the data that in, a, in, a, in production automatically, right? Um, if you think like, let's say time series, you had a point and then there's a missing point and there's a new point. Uh, what do we do this point in the middle that was missing? Do we interpolate linearly? Do we use a spline? Do we use the last value? How do we do it without looking into the future? Um, basically, it's an optimization problem. Um, there's infinite ways to, to deal with it. And the question is, how can the machine decide what is the best way to deal with it at this point in time? Cool, perfect. And then we've got actually quite an interesting question from uh, Gina, which I'll try and shorten because it's quite long. But in a nutshell, um, how do you perform causal discovery without assumptions? So what sort of methods do you use? Do you have a peer reviewed publications on these methods? Yeah, so every method will have assumptions. The question is, are those assumptions limiting for the real world business case you're solving, right? So what I'm, you know, just to be clear, I'm not suggesting there's no assumptions at all. I'm suggesting uh, the assumption are not as limiting as of current methods. So, so it's about going from severely limiting assumptions like no stationarity, feedback loops, whatever, that basically make it impossible to add value to having methods that have assumptions but are not so restrictive and that allows you to, to solve real world problems. And we do not publish uh, our methods. Uh, we, we, may, we publish other things, but we do not publish our proprietary methods because that's kind of the core of the IP. This is why people come and license our technology because they cannot access these methods elsewhere. Cool, makes sense. Um, and then we've got a kind of two questions, I guess, tied together. Um, could you go into more detail about your typical uh, meth methodology is what Dan's asked, but then someone else has also asked, um, where was it? Can you please tell us a bit more about the math behind the methodology? So I think those are kind of two obviously related questions. I don't know if you're allowed to say anything or if you can give us an idea. Yeah, the math, I think it will be a little bit beyond the scope of a talk, but uh, I can give you a little um, uh, overview of the process. 
So normally when you do data science, the traditional way you get some data, you do some cleaning, then you do some feature engineering, um, feature selection, algorithm selection, parameter selection. Okay, cool. Uh, causal modeling, very different. You take dirty data uh, and a lot of it, you don't need to worry about, you know, is it a lot of data? Uh, you say, here's all my dirty data. Um, you automatically do causal discovery. Uh, from that process, you get a causal diagram, which tells you basically the data generating processes of that data set. It tells you, you know, think of it, it's, it's a causal diagram. So there's a cause and effect relationship uh, and there's the nature of that relationship as well. So you have nodes and you have, uh, you know, edges and uh, that, that allows you to, to visualize uh, and then you can decide whether you want a human to intervene or not. That's an optional step. So you can have the human actually add extra information to the causal diagram. And as I said, this is a lot, it goes way beyond feature selection. It's a lot more, there's more rich context you can bring in. And then the last step is, um, is, is fitting a causal model uh, that takes input a causal diagram. Um, and so this is, um, this is, if you like, the, the simplistic step. So dirty data, Causal diagram, causal diagram, causal model. Makes sense. With optional human input. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Just on the back end. Cool. Perfect. So we've got, we've got quite a lot of questions left, but we're kind of um, uh, wrapping up and running out of time. So I'll ask Amy if she can pop in the chat now the details for, you know, to get a hold of Darko. If you want to reach out, if you want to learn a bit more, a couple of you were asking, you know, how do I, how do I apply? Like what, what are the next steps? You know, please reach out to Darko on there. We'll pop it in the chat. Um, again, just want to have say a massive thank you to Darko. Really appreciate your time today um, and joining us at the Data Science Festival. Alessandro, are you are you still there? I don't just want to abandon you. <laughs> yes. So can we hear Is me it now? working? Yes, cool. Yeah, perfect. It's working. Well. It's lovely. Good. Honestly, <laughs> but, yeah. this the te technology is just yeah, is, is winning so. this whole week. <laughs> cool. Well, perfect. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, you know, for volunteering Thanks. today. Thank you again, Darko. Thank you to all our, our attendees. And again, please reach out uh, on the Slack channel if you want to Darko via LinkedIn, which is in the chat. Um, and if you're looking for any of the uh, recordings, the information's in the chat as well. So other than that, thank you guys very much. Um, did you enjoy it, Darko? Yes, thank you so much for the invite and thank you everybody for, for taking the time um, uh, to join today. Perfect, thank you guys so much. So looking forward to see you guys tomorrow uh, at the next Lunch and Learn. Other than that, have a great day and see you all soon. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.